All right, guys, Tidal Potomac, Tidal Potomac, pre-spawn, spawn-ish conditions. Mostly in the upper 70s today um, on the Virginia side of the Tidal Potomac once again today as well as tomorrow. We will be back out. Obviously, we've got some BFL events coming up here in the next few weeks. Uh, two divisions of the BFL coming up on the Potomac. And plus, we have seven events, seven events scheduled that I'm aware of this weekend on the Tidal Potomac and a combination of boater events, derbies, and kayak fishing events. Um, obviously, some of the kayak fishing events will have a lot of overlap because there are a lot of guys that are going to fish all of them together. So it kind of sometimes... When people tell me there's going to be 100 kayakers out on, in Madeline Woman Creek, I'm like, well, there's really not going to be 100 because a lot of guys are, are entering all of those events. So it looks like when you take the totals from all the events, it looks like it's 100, but it's not going to be 100. Um, just food for thought. Um, but again, pretty consistent this week with the Tidal Potomac in terms of the conditions. Obviously, we had a lot of rain that actually did wreak some havoc in the water. Going into the week, we've gotten some stabilization. We've gotten less rain, obviously. Water starts to turn a little bit. Well, now we're going to get more rain again at the end of the week. Um, and so that's something you want to think about for a lot of these guys are going to go out and fish in. And the guys that are pre-fishing, are tons of people fishing, pre-fishing for events this week out on the Tidal Potomac. That's for sure. Um, because of just, it's that time of year. Um but it's still, by any accounts, a pre-spawn condition. Um, but in this video, I want to talk about some baits in a second. But for this video, I want to talk about what I learned. Okay? Um, because if you're going to be a co-angler, all right? Or if you are a co-angler, and you're going to be on the back of a boat with somebody, all right? In events like the Tidal Potomac coming up, okay? There's a pretty good, there's probably a 70% chance, maybe even more. But a 70% chance that you are going to get paired with a boater with forward-facing sonar. Okay? Now, forget about what everything has been said about forward-facing sonar. Should it be banned? Should it not? All that talk is all about at the top level. Okay? And I wouldn't concern yourself with it. If you're going to be competing in these events, especially at the BFL level, okay? Guys are going to have forward-facing sonar. Probably for the near... I mean... Okay, you can either accept that or you can let it get in your way. Okay, I am sir, I am not a I am not a uh, protagonist of forward facing sonar, and I'm not a detractor of forward facing sonar either. Okay, um, you know I'm like right in the middle, um, because I understand it's just a tool. So today's experience, okay, for the Tidal Potomac, is if you're a co angler and your boater is utilizing forward facing sonar. There are various questions that you want to get in the habit of asking your boater. Okay? Um, especially if you're not privy to what he is looking down at. Okay? In the front of the boat. Right? Um, first of all, you want to know if he, you are actually on fish. Right? If, if, right? But more importantly, you also want to know exactly what level the fish are at. And how active they are. Okay? Um, and those are questions you can respectfully ask of your boater. Now, if you have a relationship or you're fr or with that with your boater, it's a completely different thing. They're, they're forthcoming. But not all boaters are going to be forthcoming with everything, you know, with a co-angler in the boat on competition day. They're kind of wired in, right? They're dialed in and focused on them. They're not focused really on you, okay? Um, most. There are some that are very gracious, very, you know, um, you know, in that regard. But for the most part, you know, they're concentrating on play, putting that bait right on the nose, so to speak, of what they're looking at, right? They're not you're they're not worried about you in the back of the boat, right? Um, and you've got to accept that. But what I'm learning the more times that I'm out with somebody as a co-angler on their boat, especially people that are using forward-facing sonar because it's really new to me. Um, it's not something that I would you're going to be utilizing a lot of, especially where I fish for smallmouth. Um, so it's always interesting to get that flavor, you know, of what it's really like out in big water um, with people running forward-facing sonar. And I'm going to tell you, people say whatever they want. It helps you locate fish, folks. Like, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, like, I know there's a lot of arguments out there. 
it don't catch fish for you. And I learned that hard today. And so did, okay, Mike. Like, it don't, it don't, like, you still got to catch them. Like, I mean, you can't any around it. There's no way around it. I mean, you can see them. They can be there a couple times a day as catfish. Okay, you can see them. But, like, you still got to freaking have an ability to catch them. So a lot of this noise about forward-facing sonar to me, like all oh, these guys, these guys running forward-facing sonar or can't, they wouldn't be able to fish without it. They wouldn't be able to fish without it. You know what? You don't know if that's true. You have no idea if that's true or not. For the And these are like professional people or content professional anglers on, on YouTube making absurd claims like you have no idea whether or not, tra like in people in, down in Texas that won a Bassmaster or the guy who won the Bassmaster Classic or whatever could, I mean, clearly he got to where he got at the level he got by being a very talented, skill set oriented angler. And these people that are dismissing these young anglers for utilizing a tool to help them locate fish. Forward facing sonar has never caught a single fish, to my knowledge, in its entire technological evolution. It's never caught a fish. Okay? It's put anglers in a position to catch fish. Okay? And we lose sight of that fact. And just because you have forward facing sonar, and just because you're on top of fish, doesn't mean you're going to catch them. Okay? And there's nothing truer than that on the tidal Potomac. Okay? So you want to know where your boater is placing the boat. And is he right on top? Okay, is he right on top of him? Right? Is he how, what? Where his head's at and where he's boat positioning? Okay, to attack the fish that he's seen on his forward-facing sonar live scope. You know, um, you know, take your pick. Um, and what I've tried to adapt myself when I try to go to like be a co-angler with someone or to enter an event like a BFL event, um, that's the Phoenix Bass Fishing League um, for MLF for those who aren't familiar, um, is um, how am I going to fish it? How am I going to approach the day? And and the number, and I learned today, this is how I went. Remember, folks, if you're watching my channel, a lot of times it's important to note that if I'm going out, I usually have a plan and that plan isn't just like, you know, it's I want to I want to prove something to myself, or I want to try something out, or I want to experiment on a pattern, or I want to. It's an educational experience for me. Okay, I know it's kind of crazy, but it's very mental for me. It's very, and so so today I realized I knew it was I knew what the plan was. I knew where we we're gonna where we we're gonna be going. I knew we were gonna be gonna go in the chain. I knew we were gonna go out off of points. I knew we were gonna be looking for staged largemouth staging largemouth bass. Um. And so, and you, utilizing forward-facing sonar, um, and those things. And so, I wanted to in my mid I was like, okay, I'm going to be on the back of the boat. How how am I going to approach this? I could just bitch about going out with forward-facing sonar and junk fish and whatever, or I could actually have a plan. So my plan again was to feed off of what I learned yesterday. Okay, and what I learned, what how how I got bit yesterday, and I was getting bit yesterday on, um, as I showed you in the previous video, this square bill crankbait. Okay, again, hear that? Okay, here's the similarity of what's happening on the title for me on the title Potomac this week. Okay, okay, boom, and I showed you guys those uh, lipless crankbaits. Okay, so I, I looked and I analyzed the fish that I, the, the baits that caught me fish all had one thing in common. Noise. That's what they all had in common. Every single bait had noise. So that today I figured my, my plan of attack was, okay, he's working on a pattern that he hopes he can apply in May, early May. Okay, obviously... We're a good ways away from May, obviously. So two weeks, two weeks or so, three weeks or so. So everything could change. It always does. But it's just fundamentally learning curve, right? I want to be working on, okay, you're going to be working that pattern. How, what can I do if I'm put in a boat with an angler working that pattern? Okay, trying to locate fish in six to eight, six to ten feet of water staging in the event that we get bad weather and in the event spawning is the full spawn is delayed okay i believe by the second bfl event we're going to be in spawn 
But there's a chance that we're not going to be in full spawn by that first BFL event the first weekend in May. There's a chance. Now, there are going to be fish spawning, but I mean full spawn in the fishery, okay? So it's always good to have these plans, plans A's, plan B's, and plan C's, right? And so what I put together was I wanted to focus on he finds fish, he's on top of fish, he's utilizing forward-facing sonar, you know, um, not to give away his, his bait presentation, so I won't, targeting the way he's going to target them. What am I going to throw? Okay? And inevitably what I'm building on what I've learned the past couple days is I need to be throwing baits that will draw whatever fish he's targeting on his forward-facing sonar out to me. Because remember, we're we're not casting in the same water, okay? We're casting adjacent, behind, or adjacent, okay? We're not casting to his water, all right? But inevitably, you want to draw those bass, depending on where he has the boat positioned, to you. How are you going to do that? How I have found this week, pattern-wise, is noise. Noise. Okay? Knockers, but mostly rattles. Right here. Okay? Lipless crankbait. I did it in the previous video, but these are some ones I roll up today. Heavier, because I knew we were going to be, I wanted to be a little deeper. I knew that we were not going to be as shallow, because I knew that was the goal today. Um, it was just to pass by all the shallow stuff and to go out into the bay, go out into closer to the channel. We're basically it drops to like 9, 10, 11 feet and then comes back to like 3 feet, okay? Because locating them and sure enough on forward facing sonar, that's where they were, okay? In different different areas, different, I call them pods. You know, we call them pods and small for small mouth and stuff. So pods, okay? In ditches adjacent to flats, okay? You find the flat and then look for deeper depressions anywhere near around that flat, okay? Um, so that was one, okay? And then here's another style. It's a jointed one, okay? Now this one's not a lipless, obviously, but it's got a knock to it, okay? But my two favorite money baits hopefully <laughs> they will be money baits are these right here again flashy rattly okay smoother action in the water look at that profile okay these profiles guys okay remember what's happening in the fishery right now okay and then this one right here Give you a better look at it. But what's happening in the fishery right now? Is you got the runs, man. <laughs> Not our kind of runs. You got the shad run, okay? You got hickory. Some people have said sightings of American, um, you know, but you got the hickory shad. You got them going up, okay? You got them moving, okay? You've got all that activity happening, okay? And so targeting that stuff. For me, that's what I wanted to use, and that's what I did successfully, is to draw some of those bass out, okay, from where they are, okay, 25, 20 yards, 20 yards away from where he is and the fish he's targeting. And the only way I know that you can do that is that noise, okay? Having that draw, a rattle, a knocker, a thump, okay? And then coming back in, then coming back in, it was a little different, okay? So I'd done that, and we would come coming back into the ramp is when I started to utilize a few other baits that I normally wouldn't throw. They aren't necessarily my style, but I wanted to see how they would work because I knew still from the pattern recognition and from the behavior, there are some males moving up. There are some males that are, are roaming, that are beginning that, that kind of phase to begin to make beds, okay? And so, you know... Again, pulling on that pattern coloration is underspin, okay? Underspin, high, uh, always highly effective. Drop the jig, 
the jig pretty much for me is always in the marinas, in the docks, on the pilings. It's not in the ditches for me. Um, you know, I know a lot of guys will throw those crank, uh, throw the chatter baits along the ditches or along the grass lines. Some of the grass is coming in. You know, that's a great, if you're a chatterbait guy, that's an, another opportunity. Um, and then I actually threw this and caught, caught a pretty nice, pretty nice little bass today. Okay. Cause it looks just like those shad running up the river. Okay. Um, and then one other crankbait, one other crankbait I did utilize today. Um, and I really like the pattern. It's a kind of a cracked shad pattern. Um, is this one right here? It's a cracked shad pattern. Okay. Square build. Again, do not sleep. Do not sleep right now on your crankbaits, whether they be lipless or they be square bill right now. I'm not saying that you're not going to be able to catch fish this weekend or over the next week, week and a half on other other baits like chatter baits. Um, but I'm going to let you in a little something. A little something, a little juice. Um, and that you might want to roll with. I'm just going to say you might want to roll with. Because we're talking shad, we're talking migration, we're talking those forward species, right? And that movement is still happening, right? And the bass want to begin to feed up. And I'm not a big brand guy. You guys know that. I'm, I'm more of a custom guy and a JDM guy. I'm not, you know, traditional brand guys. But I have to tell you. And I'm not sponsored by them. I'm not going to get any cred at all for pimping their bait. Okay? But I'm going to tell you. I got two custom pours that I love. Okay? But I'm going to tell you. There's something to be said for this guy right here. Okay? It's got that hinge that holds that hook in place. For those of you who don't know, this is a Nessie. This is a 5, five inch Berkeley. Okay? Look at that. This is what we're talking about, guys. This is what's in the river right now. Okay? Moving around. Going nuts. Okay? Still. Because of that rain. Slowed it down a little bit. And they're starting to come back again. Okay? This is what's to get feeding, feeding up on. So, my, my, if you're out there tomorrow, if you're out there, you know, the next couple days or this weekend, maybe you're in an event this weekend, run by your freaking local tackle shop, big box retail store, and pick yourself up one of these if you can find them five inch they usually are loaded with the sevens i'm not that's too much for me um you know if you can't find one give me a holler okay um but my preference okay my preference now don't get me wrong right there line through right there okay shad pattern perfect this time of year so those are my preferences so if you're stuck and if you're in your jam and you're local, give me a holler. I'll set you up.